April 11, 2016, Kota Baru, Malaysia. A panic would begin at a school on a Monday when several students and teachers would report seeing a black figure in the school. Sightings continued to be reported for the next two days, with around 100 people being affected by what they believed to be paranormal experiences, such as some students who reported seeing an alternative dimension of blood and decay. Others claimed to see alternate dimensions, which were difficult to explain. One witness would even take a photo of what they alleged to be a shadow vampire creature, although it is uncertain what the object in the photo really is. It got so bad that by Thursday, the school was closed down to bring in Islamic traditional experts, scholars, and even witch doctors to carry out prayer sessions and exorcisms. The school would reopen that Sunday, but screaming and shouting would continue to be heard at the secondary school. A senior school staff member told the press that our students were possessed and disturbed by these spirits. We are not sure why it happened. We don't know what it is that affected us, but the place is a bit old and these children can be disobedient sometimes and throw their rubbish around the school grounds. And here's the important part. The school staff member then speculated that they had possibly hit a djinn and offended the spirits. And a djinn is a spiritual creature in Islam and Arabic folklore. They can be good, evil, or neutral and have free will like humans and unlike angels. And they are more popularly known in the West as the wish-granting genies. But back to the school, the staff member who insinuated that it could have been a djinn would state that when holding one of the students, her arms felt extraordinarily heavy. And when this student recovered and went home, the teacher still felt as if someone was hanging on to the left side of her body and would not let go. She would also see flashes of a black figure. More teachers would also come forward and state that they had seen this black figure. While others would cite the spirits were trying to enter their body, which caused them to feel numb and cry. But after many prayers, they began to feel better. This one is obviously chalked up to mass hysteria due to the factors such as strong religious beliefs and isolation from family. While some conclude the Pingala Chapa creature was a true spirit of some kind. June 14, 1988, 25-year-old Philip Fraser would leave his home in Anchorage, Alaska to head to Evergreen College in Washington State. And by June 17th, after being delayed two days due to car trouble, he would cross the Canadian border. It was here at the checkpoint his two firearms were seized by patrol agents since it was illegal to bring firearms into Canada. But after an hour, they released him on his way. The next day, about 600 miles from the border checkpoint, the owner of the 40 mile flat cafe, Gay Frocklage, and her daughter, Tina, would be met by a hitchhiker who had just been dropped off by someone in front of their store. The man would walk in and his behavior was very strange and they felt something was wrong with him. They possibly even wondered if he had escaped from a mental institution. Now around this same time, Philip would drive up to the cafe and while parked, began to search his car for something. Tina would walk outside to pump gas for another customer and she said hello to Philip. Meanwhile, the hitchhiker would pay for his meal, leave the cafe, and ask Philip for a ride. Philip declined at first and pulled out, but strangely, the man began running after his car. Philip, maybe feeling sorry for him, stopped and let him get in. And eight hours later, and 200 miles south of the cafe, this same hitchhiker flagged down Eddie and Pauline Olson, telling them he had car trouble. The couple would later state he was very nervous acting, but they assumed he was scared of setting out alone overnight in the great wilderness of British Columbia. They agreed to tow his vehicle back for him and would even let him spend the night in their basement. The next morning, the hitchhiker would strangely tell them that he was Philip Fraser and that his parents were doctors in Anchorage and that he was going to Washington State to study medicine. Of course, this was the hitchhiker and not the real Philip. He would then tell the couple that he wanted to sell his car for a plane ticket. Eddie would ask to wait till Monday so they could have the purchase go through customs, but this man refused, saying he needed to leave soon. The couple became more suspicious when this man pretending to be Philip pulled out two wallets and began to act covertly. He then went out to repair the car, which had a broken fan belt, got in, and drove off. About 12 hours later, Philip's burned out car 
was found 300 miles away from Eddie and Pauline's home in downtown Prince George, British Columbia at a car wash. And sadly, six weeks later, on July 27th, the real Philip was found in a gravel turnaround 70 miles from Eddie and Pauline's home and 30 miles east of Stewart, British Columbia. He had been shot several times with a pistol, and nearly 40 years later, the man who killed him has never been identified. He was white, 5 foot 9, 225 pounds, had a flabby belly, and brown hair and brown eyes. He was described as unkempt, had rotten teeth, strong body odor, a large beer belly, and possibly even had a mental disability. He was about 20 to 25 years old then, and would be near 60 today. He was believed to be familiar with Toronto and Seattle. Detectives believe the hitchhiker learned everything he could about Philip and then killed him and may have used his identity afterwards. In fact, Philip's credit cards, checkbook, passport, and birth certificate were never recovered, and it's possible this unidentified man could still be in possession of those. There has been speculation in recent years that this unidentified man could be serial killer Michael McGray. He killed at least seven people, strangers and acquaintances, between 1985 and 1999, but it's thought he could have killed up to 11 more in that time frame, and he was also familiar with Toronto and Seattle and matched the description, although RCMP have stated he has been ruled out. Another suspect that has been brought up is a man named Roger Home Brady. He was a bank robber and was pulled over by police officer Martin Gans in 1993 in Manhattan Beach, California for suspicion of DUI. Brady would open up fire on the officer, wounding him, causing Gans to flee behind his vehicle. Brady would follow him and then shoot him point-blank in the face, killing him. He was eventually captured eight months later and set on death row until 2019, when a ban on the death penalty was ordered for the state of California. The main reason he is often linked to the case is because of the police sketches. They fit very closely to Brady, and he had ties to the Pacific Northwest, as he had already been arrested in Vancouver, Washington for an armed robbery and murder of a witness in Portland, Oregon. He would have also been 22 years old at the time of Phillips' murder. Another theory, and this one I even hesitate to mention because it is just so crazy, but some people believe Blair Adams is responsible. And if at first that name doesn't ring a bell, you no doubt know his story if you are a mystery buff. He is the Canadian man found murdered in a parking lot in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1996. Around his body was nearly $4,000 worth of Canadian, American, and German currency. Before this, he had began to act very strange, claiming people were trying to kill him, and traveled thousands of miles before finally arriving in Knoxville. It's a mystery that I do not need to retell, but many people think that Blair Adams, the center of one of the most intriguing mysteries of the true crime community, is the man that killed Philip Fraser, which is another one of the most intriguing mysteries. So, what is the reasoning behind this? Well, again, we have to go back to the sketch and description of this mysterious hitchhiker. The sketch is fairly close to Blair, and Blair would have been 24 years old at the time of Philip's murder, right in the same age range of the killer, and he was also said to be very close to the same height and weight. But we all know sketches and descriptions can be applied to a lot of people, but this isn't the only thing linking Blair to the killing. Blair also lived in Surrey, British Columbia, and was within a day's drive of where Phillip's car was found. Furthermore, Blair was familiar with Toronto and Seattle, just like law enforcement believed Phillip's killer was. Eight years after Phillip's murder, Blair abruptly up and left British Columbia to Seattle, Washington, where his mystery would just begin. However, the theory is that he made this flight because his paranoia was getting the best of him, because he now believed law enforcement was closing in on him for his murder of Philip Fraser, as well as his other criminal activities. However, that theory is a bit of a stretch to me, but I'm curious to hear what you all think. Let me know in the comment section below. Nineteen sixteen was a tense year in the world, with World War I raging on. And even though the U.S. was not involved in the war at this point, things were tense here too. At the onset of the war, the U.S. stayed neutral and really couldn't have done much anyways due to having such a small military. But this would begin to change as former President 
Teddy Roosevelt and former Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army, Leonard Wood, began a campaign called the Preparedness Movement to help strengthen the U.S. military. However, this movement was opposed by President Woodrow Wilson, who believed the U.S. should do all it could to stay neutral. He would later on, though, after the sinking of the Lusitania by Germany, and after seeing Pancho Villa continually raid the New Mexican border, agree to strengthen the military. But it's in the time frame before he agreed that the preparedness movement would see several parades held in opposition to Wilson's policies, and it's where this mystery takes place. Because on July 22nd, 1916, such a parade was organized to take place in San Francisco, but San Francisco at this time was staunchly isolationist, especially among the labor unions in the city, while conversely, due to the labor unrest and rise of Bolshevism, the San Francisco business community was nervous, and it's in this background the parade would begin. Even a week before the parade, an anti-war pamphlet was being spread throughout the city which cited that militarism could not be forced on citizens without a violent protest. The parade was the largest the city ever held. It was three and a half hours long and had over 50,000 marchers, which included over 2,000 organizations and 50 bands. And about half an hour into the parade, at 2.06 p.m., an explosion would sound. Ten bystanders were killed and 40 were wounded. One included a young girl who lost her legs. It was the worst terrorist act in San Francisco. First responders were already in the area and rushed to the scene. Once things settled down, an investigation began, and it was quickly determined that a cast steel pipe filled with explosives had detonated on the west side of Stewart Street, about 450 feet from the ferry building. Before capping the pipe containing the explosive, thought to be TNT or dynamite, the bomb maker had filled the pipe with metal slugs designed to act as shrapnel, increasing the bomb's lethality. Witnesses were questioned and gave all kinds of differing replies on where they thought the bomb had been set. Some said they seen a man leaving a suitcase against the corner of a building, while others said they seen a bomb being curled or dropped off a roof of a nearby building. Authorities initially looked at several of the well-known radicals and anarchists in the city. Among them was a Russian-American man named Alexander Berkman, who was a well-known leader of the anarchist movement. He had, over 20 years prior, tried to assassinate businessman Henry Clay Frick, which he failed to do, and served 14 years in prison for trying. He had just moved back to San Francisco after being implicated in another bombing conspiracy, that of the Lexington Avenue bombing in New York City. And this guy must have really leaned into the reputation because he had even started a semi-monthly anarchist periodical called The Blast. But after the bombing, he would abandon the journal and move back to New York. The San Francisco DA tried to have him extradited back, but was unsuccessful. Detectives still investigated, however, and eventually arrested two radical labor leaders, Thomas Mooney and his assistant, Warren Billings. Billings had been convicted previously for carrying dynamite on a passenger train, and Mooney had been arrested but never convicted for conspiring to dynamite power lines during a company strike. And Mooney, in particular, was hated by the conservative leaders of local unions who believed he was a dangerous troublemaker that only made their goal more difficult. The two would go to trial, and it was pointed out specifically both men knew how to handle dynamite, and Billings, in particular, was familiar with clockwork timing mechanisms and had even become a watch repairman. Police held Mooney without counsel for six days in which they interrogated him, even after invoking his right to cancel 41 times. Even at the grand jury proceedings, they were not provided with lawyers and were not allowed to clean up or shave. Of course, the grand jury returned an indictment and it went to trial. The prosecution alleged Mooney planted the bomb in a suitcase with a clock as a timing mechanism. However, the DA and police completely dismissed several witnesses who testified that Mooney and Billings did not fit the descriptions of the men they thought had placed the bomb. They also ignored anyone whose descriptions of the events that day went against Mooney being the guilty party. The two would eventually hire a well-known criminal attorney, but it didn't matter. They were both convicted and sentenced to death. However, two years later, a commission was set up by President Woodrow Wilson to look into it, and there was no clear evidence 
linking the men, and their sentences were commuted to life in prison. Mooney's case led to campaigns to free him, and it even became an international affair, with publications all around the world writing about the injustice. Even as more evidence came out of perjury and false testimony at the trial become overwhelming, the efforts to pardon the men were blocked for 20 years until the California governor, Colbert Olson, pardoned both. Since then, the real bomber, or bombers, have never been determined. Many still think it was someone from the anarchist movement, and there's several other people besides Mooney and Billings that could have done it. Others have speculated it could have been an agent provocateur who was hoping to just totally derail the union movement. Others still think Alexander Berkman, who we discussed before, yet he almost certainly did not know how to deal with bombs, but he could have been involved in the planning. Another group was the Gallianists, a group of radical anarchists who followed Luigi Galliani, in particular, Mario Buda, who we covered on the Wall Street bombing mystery in an earlier video. Buda fit at least one witness physical description of the bomber, and the Gallianists were known to use time bombs consisting of cast steel or iron pops with dynamite and metal slugs or other types of shrapnel to increase maiming and casualties. The only thing here is they did most of their attacks on the East Coast, although they had hit as far west as Milwaukee and Chicago and had sent two mail bombs to San Francisco. Galliani would even write the police and tell them the Mooney was not the bomber. The Galleonists would then go on to do nearly identical bombings to that of the Preparedness Day bombing between 1918 and 1919. One of these was the Wall Street bombing we covered before. Finally, is a man named Selston Eakland, a well-known San Francisco radical orator and passionate anarchist, and was believed to have strong ties to the anarchist community. But he died in 1927 after he was shot by police when he attempted to light the fuse of a large dynamite bomb at St. Peter's and Paul Catholic Church in San Francisco. He finally succumbed to his wounds later, but never revealed anything about the Preparedness Day bombing if he was involved. Sunday, January 29th, 1899. The quiet little village, Roten, Cheshire, England, a woman known only as Miseries Day, would attend church as usual with two other people, that of Mrs. K and N. Day who I assume is her husband. But unlike other Sunday mornings, Miseries Day's stepdaughter, Rosa Day, decided to stay home, and it was about 11 a.m. that morning she would state she intended to go out skating. Her brother had already left earlier that morning to go skate as well, going to a nearby pond with his friends from the neighborhood, where he expected to see his sister Rosa at any moment. However, she never arrived. Later that day, her stepmother would return back from church to find that Rosa was not home and her hat and skates were all missing. After checking with her brother, she now realized that Rosa never showed up at the pond and nobody actually seen her even leave the home. Her stepmother would immediately launch a search for her with other family and friends. They visited places in the district they thought she might have went to, but none of this led to anything. As the afternoon wore on and no clues came about, a bigger search party was organized and they searched the fields and ponds in the area without finding a clue. Now that it was dark, they would have to give up the search, but it started again the following morning. This time, dragging operations were conducted in several ponds, which continued on Tuesday. By Wednesday, a boat was brought in to better check out the ponds. Then, a quarry was searched. Afterwards, another canal was dragged. Thursday, the police widened the search to no avail, but just as everyone was losing hope, Rosa surprisingly showed back up Thursday night and her reappearance was just as strange as her disappearance. Shortly before 10 p.m., one of the maids would step outside when she noticed a lady's hat on the ground. This startled the young lady, and she ran back inside to relay the information. As others rushed out into the yard, they would find Rosa lying unconscious. She was immediately brought inside where medical aid was requested, and a Dr. Taylor and a Dr. Griffin would arrive shortly after. As shockingly, Rosa had been beaten brutally. Once the doctors got her stabilized, they would begin to ask her questions about what had happened. Rosa would say that after 11 a.m., she would walk out to a pond in their own field where she intended to skate, but she felt the ice was unsafe, so she went half a mile further up to another pond because she did not want to go to the one where her brother was at 
because they were playing hockey. She sat down at the side of the pond and began to put her skates on when some man suddenly come up behind her and blindfolded her. He stated he wanted money, but Rosa left her purse behind, so he would tie her hands behind her back and got physical with her and said, if you scream, I'll shoot you. Doctors deduced it was at this point that Rosa ended up with a huge wound on her forehead. It almost covered her entire brow and was penetrated to the bone. And unsurprisingly, it was also at this point that Rosa remembered very little. She did remember being taken to some kind of shed. When she recovered, she found herself in a loft until Thursday, alternating between semi-consciousness and unconsciousness. She had no idea if she was being watched or not. But by Thursday, she made a small hole in the roof, climbed up, and dropped to the ground outside. She finally made it to a stream she knew and followed it back home. She would fall a few times on the way due to exhaustion and finally fainted in her own yard to be found by the maid. In addition to the head wound, she sustained many bruises along with her face, which had been greatly swollen, while her scarf had been tainted with blood. The police responded, and as you may have guessed, the community was outraged and wanted blood. Officers combed the countryside, and detectives believed the motive was nothing more than murder, and the suspect probably assumed she would die soon after he left her in the loft. Thankfully, Rosa began to recover, but newspapers immediately began to compare her case to an infamous one in 1753, when a maid, Elizabeth Canning, claimed to have been kidnapped and held against her will in a hayloft for a month. She returned in a, quote, deplorable condition, and would claim two other women were behind her abduction. Now, this story goes pretty deep, and it's a mystery on its own, but basically, it led to this divide in public opinion where half the people believed Elizabeth was really abducted, and the other half believed she made the whole thing up. And now, papers were comparing Rosa's story to it. Detectives still investigated, though, yet they found nothing that could explain it. Once Rosa completely recovered, she would be interviewed again. She claimed the assailant was a dark man with a big lower lip, about 30 years old, and dressed as a laborer, and even compared him to a woman she knew, which she intended to be an insult, because she added... He was a horrid-looking man. She further stated he asked her for money and her watch, but she had neither. However, she had been wearing her gold brooch, which he did not bother stealing, yet her skates were missing. Detectives would actually rule out robbery because of this. Another weird point was the shed she claimed to have been kept at. According to her own version of events, the shed could not have been very far from the home, and searchers in the area not only dragged the nearby ponds, but they also checked every shed and outbuilding in the area, and Rosa was not there. But we're still left with two awful wounds to her forehead, and the question of how she survived four and a half days in the bitter winter with no food or water. It should also be noted here that the police did look into the previous weeks leading up to this moment, and they found that Rosa had an interesting brush with death right before Christmas. She had been out collecting greenery for decorating a church when she almost fell into a deep quarry. She would end up hanging onto some bushes for 20 minutes until some men showed up and pulled her back to safety, no doubt saving her life. It was said since this moment her health had gotten worse and that it was thought the incident affected her psychologically. The doctors would eventually put a hold on questioning her anymore when it was realized that in addition to the wound on her forehead, she also had a fractured skull. The doctor would not suggest how she got the injury, but it was thought that it had came from great violence. By this time, detectives had went back out to the pond where Rosa claimed she had been abducted. However, there was no trace of a struggle, although they did concede the now frozen ground could have rendered the search useless. What was odd, though, was police had still not found a shed that fit the description of Rosa's account, as there should have been a hole in the roof. The media would also interview Rosa's stepmother, who confirmed that Rosa had told her the same details that she had told police as well as stating she believed she had been hit with the butt end of a revolver or some heavy instrument. That's pretty much it on this one. Not a lot of details. I couldn't even find the people's ages, and there's no theories or suspects to speak of. December 10th, 2009. 30-year-old Stephen Kocher will leave his home in St. George, Utah, and drove nearly 300 miles north to Salt Lake City 
where he stopped and bought some gas with a debit card. He would then travel another 125 miles to West Wendover, Nevada, where he again pulled off to refuel. After this, he would continue another 100 miles to the Ruby Valley Ranch of the Neff family. Stephen knew the Neffs because he had dated their daughter, Anne Marie, previously. He told them he thought he would just stop in and see her, but she was not home, and the Neffs, who were not expecting Stephen, invited him in for lunch anyways. He told them he was on his way to visit family in Sacramento, but he didn't know if he would continue due to the bad weather. After two hours, he left and decided to return home the way he had came. Stopping to buy gas in Salt Lake City and Springville, and stopping for dinner in Nephi. By the time he arrived, he had driven 1,100 miles. Throughout the day, he had talked to his mom by phone, so they discussed Christmas plans. Stephen, in spite of going through a hard time due to financial difficulties, seemed upbeat. He had been having trouble getting a job, but was optimistic he would get one soon. Curiously, he did not tell his mother about the long road trip that day. Two days later, on December 12th, he embarked on another road trip. This time, his cell phone would ping in Overton, Nevada, about 80 miles away. That evening, he bought gas and snacks at a store in Mesquite, about 40 miles from his home. Why he was even here is unknown, but three hours later, he would buy a baby's bib and cookies at a Kmart outside of St. George, believed to be Christmas gifts for his brother and family. Around 10 that night, the neighbor would see him return to his apartment, and half an hour later, Stephen left again, and it's unsure if he ever came back that night. By the next morning, a church acquaintance, Greg Webb, would call Steve and ask him if he could lead the 11 a.m. service in his absence. Steve said he was 150 miles away in Las Vegas, but could return if needed. Webb told him not to worry about it. Then, another church member would call him later on with a similar request, and again, told Steve not to worry about it since he was in Vegas. Neither had bothered to ask why he was there, and neither felt there was anything strange about the conversation. At 11.54 a.m., a home security camera in a retirement community in Southern Henderson, 135 miles from his home, would record Stephen's car being driven into a cul-de-sac where it was later found. Six minutes later, a figure dressed in a white shirt and slacks, believed by his family to be Stephen, walked in the opposite direction down the sidewalk in front, carrying what appeared to be a folder or portfolio. Shortly afterwards, another security camera in a garage adjacent caught his reflection as he walked north. This was the last time Stephen was seen. Stephen's phone was still active though, and at 5 p.m. pinged a little over 10 miles northeast of where he had parked. Two hours later, it pinged at another subdivision about two miles away from the last ping. The next morning, his phone pinged two miles further north. Stephen would then receive a text from his landlord, and then an hour later, he was used to check Stephen's voicemail, but it pinged here for the next two days, and it was never used again, suggesting the phone battery eventually died. A day after the last ping, the homeowners association where Steve left his car took note and tried to find the owner. They eventually found some flyers for a window washing company in St. George that Stephen had been distributing for. They called that number, and the owner gave them Stephen's number, or they left a voicemail. They eventually located his mother, and she returned a call four days later on the 17th, and realized that no one in the family had talked to Stephen in a week. His siblings immediately drove to town to look for him. They searched the jails, morgues, and hospitals, finding nothing. At one point, they got an early lead that Stephen may have been eaten every day at an IHOP, but after speaking to the employees there, they were convinced it was not him. The Vegas Police Department canvassed the neighborhood where Stephen's car had been parked, they also used helicopters, ATVs, and sniffer dogs, again, finding nothing. About five months later, a private investigator was hired by the family, who would get a tip to search the open desert south of Henderson's executive airport. A search then began, and again, found nothing. This one is really perplexing, and none of the theories brought up really fit. His family believes, due to financial circumstances, and because he was dressed nice and carrying a folder, he was probably going for a job interview or something like that, but he parked in such an odd location, although when he got out of his vehicle, he was walking like he was going towards a destination and did not seem confused. Suicide had been proposed, but Stephen's family and friends have all stated they do not believe he would do that. 
especially considering how upbeat he had been in prior days. Also, the contents in his car suggested he was going to be returning home, such as the Christmas gifts as well as job applications. Some speculate that his recent unusual and unexplained travel in the days leading up to his disappearance suggested he was involved in some sort of illicit activity. In fact, a private eye for the family would basically assert this several years later, and in 2022, he would even talk to one of the people that lived in the area where Stephen had left his car. This man, who had not spoke publicly about what he witnessed in the 13 years since, would reveal something pretty interesting to the private eye. He stated that between 11.54 a.m. and noon, Stephen would ring their doorbell and express the need for money. Then, he would walk to the other side of the street that did not have a walkway before the man would shut the door and never see him again. The private investigator believed that Stephen was delivering something illegal to one of the homes in the area and knocked on the wrong door asking for the money. Whoever he was really supposed to do this illicit transaction with witnessed Stephen making the mistake of going to the wrong home and for this, he killed him. Then, whoever this was took his body and buried him in the Las Vegas Valley. However, police have interviewed the neighbors and have not named any of them suspects or persons of interest. And, a drug dog was taken to sniff over the car and did not alert on anything. Also checks into Stephen's financial history and phone records turned up nothing odd, although some point to the number of text and timing of the text from his landlord and wonder how he was involved. Neither did a search of Stephen's computer and internet browsing history reveal anything. They even looked into his borrowing history from a local library and found nothing. Stephen also kept a diary that again, there was nothing alarming found in it. Also, his family did not consider the travel to be unusual anyways. He had actually been researching family history in that area and he often went on tours of cemeteries looking for ancestors' graves as that gave him something to do during his underemployment. Finally, some people believe the man in the footage is not even Stephen, making things even more mysterious. Suriname is the smallest country in South America and is located just slightly north of the equator. It is best known as a country the scientists go to to study tropical jungles because rainforests make up over 90% of the country. It also has one of the lowest homicide ratings in South America, which would make what started happening in 2006 all the more odd. It began that February when two homeless men were killed by gunfire. Detectives would look into the case and very quickly determined the shopkeepers were trying to intimidate vagrants to keep them away from their shops. But this was quickly dismissed when another homeless man was found beaten to death with a brick. Then another was doused with gasoline and set alight. Four more were decapitated and in at least two murders, the bodies had been purposely drained of blood like it was some kind of ritualistic killing. Several other victims were never identified and by 2014, Police put the body count at 12 total, but could not dismiss there were many more. Police aren't even sure if the murders are random or if, like some speculate, a serial killer operating in the area because there is evidence that it could be satanic rituals, with one forensic psychologist with the government believing whoever was doing this believed they were drawing some sort of power from the murders. And in October 2006, police did catch a break when a man heading to work seen a lone figure dressed like a homeless man attack another man with an axe. When the witness screamed, the killer ran off and escaped in a car, where police believed an accomplice was waiting. However, this break never led to anything, and this is another one where there's just not much publicly available. April 29th, 2003, Nashville, Tennessee. 13 year old Tabitha Tudors would leave her home around 7.30 to 8 in the morning to go to the bus stop to head to school. She routinely caught the bus every day at this spot, just two blocks from her home. And when the normally reliable Tabitha didn't return home by that late afternoon, her mom knew something was wrong. She would go to the school to see if anybody had answers, but she couldn't find anybody at the school. So she came home and called her husband and Tabitha's father, and they would go back to the school and finally a custodian let them in and told them there was a teacher with some other kids around the corner. They hoped Tabitha was there, but to their shock, 
Not only was she not there, but this teacher would tell her parents that Tabitha had not been there all day. So now, they both knew something was terribly wrong and their daughter had been missing for at least eight hours. They seriously doubted she would have skipped school and ran off. She was a good student. The Nashville PD was immediately called and by the time they had responded, it had been close to 10 hours since she had left home that morning. A massive search was launched in what would become one of the biggest missing person cases in Nashville's history. They went door to door asking neighbors, brought in dogs, talked to people, did water searches. They went all out, but there were few witnesses and even fewer clues. Police would just claim she ran away, but after they looked into it more, they were now convinced foul play had occurred because a cursory search of her room found she hadn't taken any clothes with her and the little money she did have was left behind. She hadn't packed anything, but the search of her room did find one clue that is a mystery to this day, that of a handwritten note that had the initials TDT and MTL. And investigators and pretty much everyone all agree that TDT stands for Tabitha Danielle Tudors. But who is this MTL? First, they would look at all the students at school, then people in her circle of friends, but there was nobody with those initials. A family friend was eventually found whose son had those initials, but he was even younger than Tabitha, so he wasn't really looked into. But detectives did find a couple of witnesses who seen Tabitha moments before she vanished. One lady on the corner said she seen her walking towards the bus stop. Further down the street, another neighbor said he had seen her walking down the hill with a piece of paper in her hand. Finally, the last witness was a little boy at the second bus stop that said he seen her getting into a red vehicle. He said he seen her walking towards the bus stop and the red car pulled up next to her and she got in the car with the man, or at least he believed she got in the car because when it drove off, she was gone. It was a red kind of sports looking car and he thought it was being driven by a black male wearing a hat. Although, in later witness reports, some would say it was a green compact car. Regardless, police had been cautious to confirm if they believed this sighting was legit or not, especially since her parents said they had always taught her not to get into a car with a stranger, so they felt it had to be someone she knew. There was also no screaming or a struggle that took place. However, this little boy was the only one at the bus stop that originally reported seeing this, but during the initial search with the dogs, they did follow her scent all the way to the point where that boy alleged she had gotten into the car, and that's where the dogs then lost her scent. His description of a black male wearing a ball cap and driving a red car did give police an early lead, that of Tabitha's sister's ex-boyfriend, who resembled the description, but since the description was very vague, it didn't mean much. Plus, he had an alibi at work and passed the polygraph early on, so he was cleared. This led to speculation though, if the witness seeing her getting into the red car is accurate, how did he convince her to get in? Did he have a gun? Tell her that her mom was hurt and he was going to take her to see her? Almost everyone that knew her said she would never voluntarily get into a car with a stranger and police believed this was the case. The search would eventually go cold though, but over the years there would be some crazy leads. One claimed she was seen in Fremont, Nebraska of all places, some 700 miles away. This was a false lead though. Another time, she was supposedly seen in Vegas. That too didn't pan out. Then another time, on October 30th, 2003, a truck driver reported seeing her in Linton, Indiana. He claimed she was in the company of a man and appeared anxious and afraid. Later, he seen the missing persons flyer and realized it was her and called police. What makes this one really strange though is a hotel clerk in the same town also called police to report a girl resembling Tabitha had came in with the man. Again, these were not confirmed. Another thought that really picked up steam later on was that she had been going to a library where it was reported she may have been going to use a computer where she would go talk to people in chat rooms. Detectives followed this line of thinking for a while before it ultimately became a dead end. By 2020 though, a new lead would surface. Police stated they now believed she had been abducted and trafficked and could still be alive. But even this felt like a shot in the dark. And it all goes back to this, lack of evidence. There's zero in the way of physical evidence and outside the three witness sightings, there's just nothing to go on. And although it is a really tough case, police haven't really done themselves any favors. 
they have made crucial mistakes and have straight up looked inept. At the beginning, they were convinced she ran away, which caused the public not to come forward and report anything they may have seen, while several potential suspects were never even questioned, or at least not for several months after her disappearance. One of these that came early on was a man seen in the neighborhood that was known to be suspicious. After her disappearance, he would talk bad about Tabitha to other children in the neighborhood where he would tell them she was not innocent and went on to make some crude sexual remarks about her. He even said he seen her the morning she disappeared, but police never bothered to interview him despite the whole neighborhood reporting him. Then there was a convicted pervert who lived in the area that had also kidnapped a teen just two blocks away from Tabitha's bus stop and he had been known to try and get girls to go for a ride on his motorcycle with him. Again, after multiple reports, police were not interested in interviewing him. There's also another simple fact that there were multiple sex offenders living within a one mile radius of Tabitha's home, and it's never been disclosed how many of these people were questioned, if any. There was also another story where a volunteer who was helping with sex workers trying to leave the lifestyle would contact police when a prostitute told her that she and a client had cruised the street Tabitha lived on. She told the volunteer that he had a laptop in his car and told her he was looking to pick up a girl named Tabby. The volunteer went to police to give this tip and never even heard back from them. They didn't even ask how to get into contact with her. And there might be a reason why they ignored all these clues that kept coming in. Detectives were solely focused on one person, that being Tabitha's older sister, Jamie right from the get-go, but why did they focus on her? There are a few reasons, although not very good ones. She was the only person in the home that morning when Tabitha went to school, but she was asleep, which I guess police did not believe. She would take four lie detector tests and failed three of them, but she would claim this was because they told her they were going to take her children from her if she failed, so she blamed the stress of that hanging over her head for failing the test. However, she has fully cooperated with the investigation and has never even hired a lawyer and her family believes police just blamed her because of how bad they started off the investigation. But it does look like they eventually moved on from Jamie and from the last report I could find, the cold case detective now has 10 possible suspects. Nineteen thirty three, Mexico City. One of the most puzzling archaeological finds, or what many call an out-of-place artifact, was discovered, that of the Tecoxic Kalichikawaka bearded head. The terracotta head was most likely part of a larger figurine, and it was found along with a number of objects made of gold, copper, turquoise, rock crystal, jet, bone, shell, and pottery. What makes it intriguing is it's alleged to be of Roman origin, and there's actually a considerable amount of proof that it could be. The director emeritus of the German Institute of Archaeology said, the head is without any doubt Roman, and the lab analysis has confirmed that it is ancient. The stylistic examination tells us more precisely that it is a Roman work from around the 2nd century AD, and the hairstyle and the shape of the beard present the typical traits of the Severian emperors between 193 and 225 AD. A thermoluscinescence test was performed on the head in 1995, and it was found to have been created sometime between the 9th century BC and the middle of the 13th century AD, which is an absolutely huge window of time, but it does confirm that it was made before Spain arrived in the New World. So how did it end up in Mexico City, since the Romans had no knowledge of the New World, allegedly? One theory is the whole thing was a hoax. According to one story about the discovery, the whole thing just comes down to a prank by one archaeologist on another. However, that has never been confirmed and has always just been hearsay. Another theory states that since the burial site was dated to between 1476 and 1510, then it's conceivable one of the early European visitors, like very early from Spain, could have brought it along with him and then died during exploration and was buried with the head. However, and this is another pre-Columbian theory, some say it could have been brought as early as hundreds of years before the Vikings were exploring. And if you consider that, it opens the door for more similar theories, like the possibility that it was brought over by an Indian or Chinese trading ship who 
had came into possession of it through trade with the Europeans, while a more simple theory states that after a Roman shipwreck, some part of the ship remained intact and got caught in the Atlantic current and got pushed to Mexico, where it washed ashore and was taken by one of the local natives. Death Valley National Park sits on the California-Nevada border and lies next to Death Valley, which of course is a desert and one of the hottest places on Earth during the summer. And it is also home to a geological formation known as Devil's Hole, which is a geothermal pool within a cavern. And it's this weird area that is the home of our next mystery, because in the spring of 1892, a man named George May would report to the San Francisco Examiner sightings of a massive reptile that had been taking place around the area, and that it was such an issue that a search party was organized to find the creature. According to George, a man known as E.W. Spear had the first encounter. After he followed a strange trail the cryptid had left, he would walk up on the creature and he estimated it as being 30 feet long. He, of course, would run from the scene to tell the town. And of course, they all laughed it off. But it wasn't long after this, another resident, Henry Brown, would report to have seen the same beast before fleeing. That's when geologist Oscar W. Clark, working with the Royal Academy of Sciences, made a report on his sightings that it started being taken more seriously. He had been staying in the town Daggett, doing research on geological features there, when he would head towards the resort city of Coronado for some rest. And to get there, he had to pass through Death Valley. He was about 30 miles away from Daggett, and it was around 6 p.m. when he stopped to rest. He was excitedly looking at some of the fossils he had collected earlier in the day, when suddenly, he would look to the southwest out into the desert haze, where he seen a strange entity moving along roughly one mile away from his position. The scientist could not resist and made his way towards it, and he seen something that both elated and horrified him. He described a creature that was 30 feet long and partially walking on its hind feet, dragging itself through the sand. It left strange tracks which showed three-toed feet and a peculiar scratchy configuration in the sand beneath it whenever it changed from walking to dragging itself. Its forelimbs were very short, but it sometimes used them to grasp at scraggly pieces of vegetation to eat. When the animal stood upright, it was about 14 foot tall, and its head was the size of a large barrel and was shaped like that of a horse. The body was large as an elephant's, and its tail was like that of an alligator. The whole thing was liver colored with bronze spots, and its eyes were described as being the size of saucers and as projecting out of its head and looked like they were gleaming of fire, while steam-like vapor came from its mouth and smelled horrible. He stated the beast was on the edge of a great sinkhole of alkaline water, which his guides had previously told him was bottomless. Clark moved towards the beast until he was around 100 yards away, where he watched the creature for half an hour. The beast then let out a blood-curdling scream, brought itself to the edge of the hole before lashing its tail and laying down to sleep. Clark backed off and would ask the guides to go help him capture the monster, and they obviously refused. Clark, though, would send his report to the Smithsonian, hoping they would send a party to capture the reptile. He was certain it was an iguanodon. So, is it possible a long extinct dinosaur is or was still living in one of the harshest deserts in the world? Not likely. As researchers have looked into this report and have found, they are not able to match the people in the story to any real known people, meaning the whole thing was probably a fabricated account to drive up newspaper sales. March 1898, the British Empire would begin work on a railway bridge over the Savo River in Kenya. It was part of a larger project that connected Uganda to the Indian Ocean via railway. At this building site were several camps spread out over an eight mile area, mostly home to the several thousand Indian workers who had came to complete the arduous task. And if this job wasn't tough enough, the workers here would be under another threat soon, one that would lead to several films about the events. Because over the next nine months, two mainless male Savo lions would stalk the campsite, drag workers from their tents at night, and devour them. During this time frame, 
There was a period of several months when the attacks did stop. However, other nearby settlements would then start to experience the same attacks. However, after this little break when they left camp, they would return with a vengeance. Because the two lines were killing workers almost daily, crews tried to scare off the lines by building fires or building thorn fences around the camp to try and protect them. But it did nothing, because they would leap over the fences or crawl through them. Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson documented the bizarre behavior and noted that early on, only one line would enter at a time, but later on, they became much more brazen, entering together to take one victim each. And as you can imagine, as the attacks got more frequent, hundreds of workers left, and at one point, the construction on the bridge had to stop altogether. Even the district officer for colonial affairs, a Mr. Whitehead, narrowly escaped being killed shortly after arriving at the train depot. He did suffer four lacerations down his back, though. His assistant, Abdullah, however, was sadly killed. Colonial officials had seen enough and now decided something must be done. Lieutenant Patterson was set traps and tried several times to ambush the lines at night from a tree, while around 20 Indian infantrymen were deployed to help with the hunt. Patterson, after many unsuccessful attempts, would shoot the first line on December 9th, about a half a year after the attacks began. It was 9 feet 8 inches and took 8 men to carry it back to camp. Patterson would write that he had only wounded it at first with his high caliber rifle by hitting it in the hind leg. It escaped and returned at night to stalk Patterson as he tried to hunt it, but he spotted it and shot it through the shoulder, killing it. The second line was shot 20 days later, but it took 9 shots over an 11 day period before the last shot to the head ended the carnage. Patterson would claim that even while crippled, he was still trying to reach and kill him. Although totals have been far exaggerated about the number killed, some say over 100, the most quoted number is between 28 and 31. Although, this number is disputed too, cause that is the number from Patterson's journal, which only documents the Indian workers, and Patterson did state the number was much higher among the African workers, but those numbers were not documented. In 2009, with much better scientific testing, researchers were able to estimate that in the nine-month period, one line ate around 11 people, while the other most likely devoured 24, giving a total of at least 35. However, the researchers did note the two combined could have possibly devoured 72 people. But the mystery here is, why? As lion attacks are really not that common, and for this number of attacks by the same two over a period of nine months, is just unheard of. There are a few theories. One is an outbreak of cattle plague in 1898, which devastated the lion's usual prey and forced them to find alternative food sources. While another theory cites, they may have grown accustomed to finding dead humans at the Savo River crossing. And another argument that has been debated since day one is the first lion had a severely damaged tooth, which caused him great difficulty in killing its natural prey which led to it targeting softer prey, such as humans. However, Patterson, who killed the lions, commented that damaged tooth came from his rifle when the lion charged at him one night. But a 2017 study did confirm that one of the lions had an infection at the root of his canine tooth, which made it hard for that lion to hunt its normal prey, such as zebras and wildebeest. So as you can see, the tooth theory is one that has went back and forth forever. June 24th, 1973, New Orleans, Louisiana. A local establishment called the Upstairs Lounge would have its typical beer bus drink special that attracted the usual blue collar gay crowd. And no surprise, it was a success with around 100 patrons coming in between five until the drink special ended at seven. Once ended, the crowd slimmed down some to between 60 and 90 people where many sat around and listened to a pianist and then discussed an upcoming fundraiser for a local children's hospital. But at 7.56 p.m., a buzzer from downstairs sounded, and the bartender, Buddy Rasmussen, would ask patron, Luther Boggs, to answer the door as he was expecting a taxi. Boggs opened the door to a nightmare, though, as he seen the entire front staircase was engulfed in flames, 
Along with the smell of lighter fluid, Buddy immediately led some 20 patrons out the back exit to the roof where they could access a neighboring building's roof and climb down to the ground floor. Others weren't so lucky. They turned around to see the floor-to-ceiling windows as their only means of escape, despite the fact there were safety bars on the windows that had a 14-inch gap between them. Several people, thankfully, made it through, although some of them were burning when they reached the ground below. Boggs, the man who spotted the fire first, was one of the ones that escaped through these bars. After pushing his female friend through, he would die 16 days later from third-degree burns all over his body. Meanwhile, a Reverend Bill Larson from the Metropolitan Community Church, America's first national gay Christian fellowship, removed an air conditioner unit from the bottom of one of the windows and was trying to get out when the upper pane of glass fell on him, pinning him to the window frame, half in and half out of the building. His charred remains would be visible to onlookers for hours. Firefighters were two blocks away, but were blocked by traffic. One finally made it through and quickly put the fire out. Two of these firemen, Terry Gilbert and Arthur Lambert, described the scene as horrific, with flames shooting from the building and people trapped inside. In total, 28 people died at the scene. One died on the way to the hospital. Another three succumbed to their wounds later on. Many of the victims were trapped behind the barred windows, while others died in the stampede trying to escape. It would be the deadliest attack on a gay club in history until 2016 Orlando nightclub shooting. An investigation started shortly after, and there was only one real suspect, a man named Roger Dale Nunez. He had actually been ejected from the bar earlier that evening after fighting with another customer. Police tried to interview him, but he was in the hospital with a broken jaw and could not respond. Detectives would question him later on, though, and they reported he seemed calm. Maybe that's because there was only one witness who stated that Nunez had been in and out of the bar during the 10 to 20 minute time frame before the fire, and this witness had seen nobody else enter or leave the building. However, detectives did note the witness who told them this seemed stressed, so they later believed he had made the whole thing up. But Nunez, well, he had been diagnosed with conversion hysteria in 1970, which is a disorder where you suffer things like paralysis or seizures, yet there's no physical cause. Instead, it's caused by psychological factors like your body is suffering emotional distress through physical symptoms. And for this, he had visited numerous psychiatric clinics. He had actually only been released a year before the fire. He was also very conflicted about his sexuality. He would eventually be arrested and was placed under psychiatric custody, where he eventually escaped, and police never arrested him again, even though he was frequently seen in the French Quarter. One friend would even tell detectives that Nunez had confessed on four separate occasions to starting the fire. He said he squirted the bottom steps with lighter fluid he had bought at Walgreens and tossed a match, and said he did not think the whole place would go up in flames. And at least one source cites a witness seeing him buying lighter fluid earlier that night. Nunez would die four years later via suicide. And in 1980, the state fire marshal's office closed the case due to lack of leads. In the decades that followed, the city officials had been heavily criticized for the investigation, or maybe lack thereof. Although, outside of the one witness statement who police deemed as untrustworthy, they didn't have much to go on. This was before security cameras were everywhere. Of course, Nunez's friend told police he confessed to the fire on four separate occasions and even gave a believable story of how it might have happened. But the problem was, Nunez had a history of mental illness, so his word wasn't taken very seriously. And over 50 years later, the case is still technically unsolved. All right, let's take a break in the action and have another mystery roundup. The following mysteries I have chosen to roll up together into one segment due to various reasons. This will allow us to spend more time on the more intriguing mysteries, starting with the Pendleton Quadruple Murders. This mystery revolved around the 2015 murders of husband and wife Michael and Kathy Scott of South Carolina, along with each one of their mothers, Barbara Scott and Violet Taylor. He was noted to be one of the worst scenes investigators in the area ever worked, with multiple stabbings and gunshots. However, it's no longer a mystery, because in December of 2023, husband and wife, Amy and Ross Velarde, were charged with their murders, and Amy, well, 
Michael and Kathy are her parents, and Barbara and Violet are her grandmothers. Quantum entanglement is a phenomenon where two or more particles become connected in such a way that the state of one particle instantly influences the state of the other, no matter the distance between them. It's like having a pair of magic coins. If you flip one and it lands heads, the other one will always land tails, even if they're on the opposite sides of the world. This connection exists regardless of the distance between the particles and seems to violate classical notions of space and time. The Robin Hood hackers are a gang of hackers called Darkseid, who are famous for targeting large companies with ransomware attacks and then donating to two different charities in 2020. The cyber criminals then posted the donation tax receipts they received for the exchange of 0.88 Bitcoin they had sent to the two charities, The Water Project and Children International. This was seen as a first among hacker groups, and no one is sure why they did it. Some speculate they may have done it because of guilt, or perhaps they wanted to view themselves as some type of Robin Hood hacker, and not extortionist. Oh dear lord, next we have the Staten Island serial pooper, when, in 2019, a woman would walk outside her home one morning to come across a pile of feces just steps away from her house. She at first thought someone didn't pick up after the dog, but it would happen again days later, so she checked the security camera and was shocked to see a man she had never seen before squatting at the curb and letting go. This was the first incident, which happened on July 13th at 1.30 in the morning, but it happened a second time just four days later, around 12.30 a.m. The woman would report it to police, who couldn't ID the man and still hasn't been to this day. Speaking of poopers, how about the Van Buren cereal pooper? This was apparently a man who was going into a Meyer store in Van Buren Township, dumping in boxes, sealing them back up, and putting them back on the shelf. What a winner. I'll be glad when we don't have to cover poopers anymore. Aren't there any better mysteries than this? Can we not look at how Lana Del Rey's last album didn't even get mentioned for record of the year? That is by far a bigger crime and bigger mystery. Stephen Paddock is a man whose name will live in infamy, as he was the lone shooter behind the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history. His motives remain unknown, and just 10 days after his murder spree, his house was mysteriously broken into. A neighbor called the police and said a light had been turned on in the home, but that he actually didn't see anyone inside. There's not much about this one, but it's thought an overzealous reporter could be responsible. The Terra Nova Islands are a set of islands discovered on March 8, 1961, when Australian scientist and explorer Philip Law would go on an expedition to the Antarctic and allegedly discover two islands they would name the Terra Nova Islands. However, no one would get around to exploring them until 30 years later when a German expedition was set to arrive and map out the islands. But when the geologists arrived at the coordinates, there were no signs of the land. They would do echo sounding at the island's location to see if they had sank, and again, found nothing. The Phantom Islands have never been seen since. The Oklahoma Girl Scout murders took place on the morning of June 13, 1977, at a camp in Oklahoma, where three Girl Scouts, Lori Farmer, 8 years old, Michelle Goose, 9 years old, and Doris Minor, 10 years old, were assaulted and murdered. An arrest was eventually made on a man named Gene Leroy Hart, a member of the Cherokee Nation. He had actually already been convicted of kidnapping and assaulting two women previously, but he escaped jail and had been at large for four years. Law enforcement believed they had an ironclad case, but Hart was acquitted and sent back to jail for his previous offenses and died in prison two years later. In 2017, advances in DNA technology strongly showed that Hart was the most likely suspect, although the case is still officially unsolved. While we're on the subject of heartless killers, the Tyumen Maniac is a Russian serial killer thought to be responsible for the death of at least eight children between the years 1997 and 2009. However, this is another one that is unofficially solved because in 2021, ex-police officer Vitaly Birisnoy was arrested in connection with the murders after he was connected to a murder of an eight-year-old which had occurred just two months earlier. 6-2 dot one zero four zero one five five four four six four nine three one space two four dot four five nine nine zero eight nine eight six four six four one four three is not only an incredibly long number but also a creepy bizarre video on YouTube. 
The video was uploaded by a user with the same name as the video and contains mysterious audio and imagery, distorted voices, scenes from the Adventures of Mark Twain cartoon, and what appears to be GPS coordinates pointing to a forest in Finland, as well as snippets of a 911 call where someone is distressed and whose screams fade away while the operator asks what's happening. The video's creator has never attempted to explain the video, but theories range from an art project, ARG, simple entertainment, confession of a murder, or a missing persons case in Finland. Neveropenit.rar is alleged to be a compressed archive that contains a file that drives people crazy. It's basically a creepypasta that spawned in Russia. Supposedly, it popped up in an online community in 2003 on a thread about the worst files. A user posted a file named neveropenit.rare that he claimed drove him to horror and left him gray-haired while it allegedly killed another user and led to the insanity of another. At some point, users could no longer access the file, which is speculated to be a GIF file. A long line of hackers and specialists have all tried and failed to crack into the file. Of course, there's no real proof of this. Finally, we have Lene Girl, whose body was found on May 31st, 2009 in Lene, Belgium, by a walker passing along a canal. She was found just over 1,000 feet from the Dutch-Belgian border, and the victim appeared to be between 14 and 24 years old. She was found naked, her legs were tied with a rope, and her throat had been cut. She had multiple stab wounds, and her body had been weighed down with barbells. It was thought she had been in the water for one to five weeks. There's very little publicly available about this case, and surprisingly, it didn't generate a lot of coverage in the news. Investigators would later state, though, that we're looking for two young men riding in a tow truck near the water gate, about 1,000 feet away. They were described as being 20 to 30 years old with black wavy hair. Now, let's get back to the other mysteries. Eighteen oh five, wealthy businessman Joseph Williamson would acquire an area of land in Edge Hill, Liverpool, England, which was then a largely undeveloped out crop of sandstone. The land had been under a lease from the West Derby Waste Commission, who retained mineral rights under it. Williamson, meanwhile, would begin to build houses on the site. These houses were a little unconventional in design, to say the least, as many said they were straight up strange, without any real planning being put into it. The ground behind them dropped sharply, and in order to provide large gardens, Williamson would build arched terraces over the gardens that could be extended. He continued to build and alter more buildings, even building a large house for him and his wife. He hired many of the poor locals for labor, and again, would do odd things, like having them do senseless tasks, like moving a pile of rubble from one place to the other, and then moving it back again. But it's what he built next that is at the center of this mystery, because he would have these workers excavate a series of brick arch tunnels and vaults at various depths within the sandstone. They covered a wide area, extending the boundaries of Williamson's lease, and possibly beyond. A 19th century antiquarian, James Stonehouse, would go through these tunnels in 1845 and describe them as vaulted passages, deep pits, and wide open chasms, which included a scary opening beneath one street with two complete four-bedroom houses in the side of it connected by a spiral passage. This tunnel building would go all the way up until Williamson's death in 1840, and no one knows why he did it. By the late 1860s, they became a nuisance, though. Since drains ran straight into them, it created a cesspool of water 15 feet deep, and people began dumping their trash there. By the end of the century, the Liverpool City Council began filling the tunnels with rubble, a process that carried over into the 20th century. Unfortunately, during this time, there was hardly anything recorded about the tunnels, and Williamson himself we know very little of, except from the account of the aforementioned James Stonehouse. So what the heck were these things built for? Well, no one seemed to care for nearly two centuries. I mean, there were a few surveys done here and there, but it wasn't until the 1980s that the tunnel started to draw more interest, although it was hard to learn much anything now since most of the passages were blocked with rubble. However, some digs did find numerous artifacts such as bottles, plates, pipes, signs, and military items, some dating back to as far as the 1830s. The true purpose of the tunnels has been left open to speculation. Again, going back to Stonehouse's account, he stated 
Williamson was secretive about the reason for building them. Interestingly, when Stonehouse planned to publish his research about the tunnels, Williamson's friend threatened to sue him for libel and trespassing, which delayed the account for years. But there is one main theory, and this one is actually kind of wholesome for a change. It seems that the whole thing was a charitable venture. Williamson's own explanation was said to be that he wanted to employ the poor and give his workers a weekly wage so they were able to enjoy the blessing of charity without losing their self-respect. And there is some support for this, the main one being, many of these archaeological features seem unnecessarily decorative, since they are hidden deep below the ground in dimly lit areas. Another example is a beautiful stone arch in a plainly constructed side chamber deep underground, with seemingly no purpose, although it has been suggested he let them build this part to improve their skills. Another suggestion was that Williamson was a member of an extremist religious sect fearing the end of the world was near and that the tunnels would protect him and his friends. But there's zero evidence for this and Williamson himself was a member of the Church of England anyways. Stonehouse, on the other hand, thought the excavation was nothing more than decorative buildings for an eccentric man. Meanwhile, during Williamson's own lifetime, locals claimed the whole project generated him a large amount of money because he was doing unlicensed quarrying. However, Williamson claimed he made very little money since he was using the stone on his own property. But it is possible that he tried to keep everything secret to avoid paying the large amounts of income tax and mineral rights duties to the city commission. Williamson retired from his tobacco trade in 1818, and when he died in 1840, his estate left the equivalent of about 3.3 million pounds, and it does appear a large part of this came from the excavations. Other theories suggest he was smuggling some kind of illegal good, or was trying to build an underground city, or was looking for hidden treasure. While others cite, he could have been dealing with an obsessive compulsive disorder. August 6, 2017, Salim Bakov, a 25-year-old singer from the Chechen Republic, would go back to his hometown in Grozny to attend his sister's wedding. The musician had caught his break around 2013 with some big-time singles that came out and was popular in Chechnya, Dagestan, and Russia. And just a little prior before going to his sister's wedding, he had applied to become a cast member on the popular Russian talent show, which was set to start a month later in September. After his sister's wedding, he was due back to Moscow just a few days later when he was scheduled to take part in a musical contest just four days later. However, on August 8th, he would be arrested by the security forces of Chechnya. His cell phone was then immediately deactivated, as well as his Instagram. Rumors began to swirl that he had been detained on the sole suspicion of being gay, and Chechnya was a country known for its persecution of gays, and Zalim had already been previously forbidden to appear in public, so the question of him being detained by the government wasn't really a surprise. But his mother and aunt would then receive a message that he had left Chechnya, yet he never arrived home. She would wait until the 18th, 10 days later, where she would then file a complaint with the Grozny police and on August 22nd, appealed to the Human Rights Council demanding answers from the Chechen Interior Ministry. The Chechen government, of course, denied any involvement and said Zalim had purchased a ticket for a train back to Moscow on August 11th. However, this did little to quiet the situation because over a month later, on September 16th, the singer's mother publicly appealed to the Chechen president, Ramzan Kadyrov, about her son, and the government still refused to open up an investigation. About a week later, a suspicious video appeared that allegedly was taken in Germany with someone that looked like Zalim. The video was uploaded to YouTube and then broadcast on Grozny TV, but many of his friends and family have doubted the legitimacy of this video mainly because there is Russian furniture and equipment in the background, as well as alcoholic drinks that are not even sold in Germany. Psychologists noted signs of distress in the video, suggesting that Zalim may have not been acting genuinely happy. A high-ranking diplomat from the EU mission in Russia would then confirm that Zalim never crossed the border after August 2017. A month later, several press outlets would report that the singer had allegedly died as a result of torture at the hands of the Chechen police as part of their anti-gay purges. In fact, one report suggested Kaderov ordered the torture and murder personally because he was insulted 
that he unknowingly shook hands with a gay man. For this, he would be tortured for 13 hours and murdered. His manager, however, suggested he may have left due to a family conflict. In fact, Chechen officials would back this up, claiming he had fled to Europe, while Kadyrov himself said he was killed by his family because they were ashamed of his sexuality. Obviously, the family has denied this. And that brings us to the end of part 21 of the Unsolved Mega Mystery Iceberg Explained. I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye and good night.